Welcome back, folks. Today I'm talking about heated beds, in particular aftermarket silicone heated beds for your 3D printer. Now there are plenty of other videos out there on this topic, however, many of them focus on like a single model of printer or a single type of heated bed, or some others are so high level that you're left with more questions than when you started. In this video, we're going to cover all the bases, and that's why I have both of the big boys on camera today. Each has an electrically different style of heated bed. So now, before we get started, I have two disclaimers. Uh, first, electricity is dangerous. 12 or 24 volts can give you a good shock, uh, it can fry your electronics, uh, it can even start a small fire. 110 volts, that can quickly kill you. If you're not comfortable working around electricity, then this should not be your tutorial video. Go watch some other videos, try some other projects, or, or maybe get a friend to come help you before you attempt anything in this video. And second, while I will be discussing a number of safety measures, the first safety measure that should be enabled regardless of your printer maker model, regardless of the type of heated bed you're using, is thermal runaway protection in your printer's firmware. Thermal runaway protection can safeguard against most common heater issues, including broken connectors, bad thermistors, bad heater cores, even like misaligned fans, and enabling it should be a no-brainer. Marlin has it enabled in most of its configurations. Clipper also has it enabled by default. However, there are a number of manufacturers, especially on the lower end, that fail to turn on this basic safety feature. If you don't have it enabled or don't know if you have it enabled, stop this video right now, go turn it on. We'll be here when you get back. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about how most electrical heaters work. Uh, most electrical heaters have a coil of wire that, when current is run through it, produces a lot of resistance that converts electricity into heat. That's how heated blankets, toaster ovens, space heaters, uh, and 3D printer bed heaters work. In most stock heated beds, that coil is in the form of traces on a PCB or, or lacquered to a sheet of aluminum, and in silicone heated beds, it's thin, flexible traces pressed between two electrically insulating sheets of silicone. Now, when you try to buy a silicone bed heater, they often advertise the size, the voltage, and the wattage. Uh, the size and shape is something that you cannot change. If you have, say, a 330 millimeter bed, you may be inclined to get a more common 350 millimeter heater and just trim off the edges. However, cutting or drilling holes through the bed will likely cut the coil, and some or all of the bed will not heat, and, and you may even cause a fire. So, buy the size and shape you need up front. You may be able to get away with a heater slightly smaller than your bed as the heat will dissipate to the edges, especially if you're sticking with an aluminum plate and printing on that, as aluminum is a great conductor of heat. However, you can probably squeeze an extra centimeter or two around the edges even on a glass bed. The next two variables are wattage and voltage, and those are two of the three variables in the electrical power formula, wattage equals voltage times amperage. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this formula as there are entire videos dedicated to just that topic. However, I'll go over it quickly to make sure we're all on the same page. So wattage is the measure of power, and in the case of a heated bed, the amount of heat generated by the bed. Within a margin of error, any bed with similar construction and wattage will heat about as fast as any other bed with similar construction and wattage, regardless of whether it's AC or DC or 12 volt or 110. A 120 watt, 12 volt heated bed will heat as fast as a 120 watt, 110 volt heated bed. That's why you often see people suggesting larger power supplies and higher voltages for printer heated beds. You can get a lot more wattage with a lot less amperage, which means a lot less heat and stress and a lot less danger. When you double the voltage from a 12 volt PSU to a 24 volt PSU, you have the amperage needed to meet a given wattage. When you move from 12 volts to 110 volt mains power, you cut that amperage almost tenfold. So now we understand the relationship between volts, amps, and watts, but what does it mean from a practical perspective? How much wattage do you really need to meet your printing goals? Well, I took some benchmarks from the 400 millimeter 24 volt OEM aluminum bed that came with the Tronxy X5SA. I also had a 300 millimeter 220 watt silicone heated bed and a 400 millimeter 110 volt AC 700 watt silicone heated bed. Keep in mind that each step up is a jump in both cost and complexity. Now, before we get into the specifics of how each bed type is wired, you will see that all of my wiring diagrams start with a fuse and a switch coming off the mains power. A fuse on the mains power is always a good idea, and it's very simple to add if you don't already have one. 
A lot of printers use the same cable connector with the built-in switch and fuse, and that's great. But if yours doesn't, then make sure you have some kind of fuse on the hot side of your mains power. Now, the simplest setup is going to be running AC power to your PSU, PSU power to your control board, and then powering the bed off of the bed connectors directly on the control board. This setup is easy to understand, and it's, it's hard to mess up. Heck, the heater doesn't even care about polarity, so assuming you can put the wires in the right holes and don't short anything out, you should be good to go. The downside is the amount of power the small switching circuitry on the board can handle is very limited, if it's published at all. I've seen anecdotal data that indicates SKR boards can support about 6 amps. That's about 72 watts on a 12 volt power supply. For something cheaper like the Chitu boards, I don't think I'd try anything over the OEM board wattage. In addition to those limitations, pushing bed amperage through the board adds heat and electrical noise, potentially causing increased board errors and shortening board life. To route power around the board and directly from the PSU to the bed heater, we'll employ an electrical switching component called a MOSFET. When the control board thinks it's heating the bed, it's really triggering the MOSFET, which will then switch power to the bed. The switching happens really fast, so you can still use PWM and get precise control over bed temperatures. And wiring a MOSFET is pretty straightforward. The DCN terminals are clearly marked, the hotbed terminals are clearly marked, and keep in mind they have no polarity, so either lead and either connector is fine. And finally, the control circuit is clearly marked, again, with no polarity. Now, just to clarify, a MOSFET is actually a specific electrical component at the center of this 3D printing MOSFET package. It's surrounded by heat sinks and resistors and diodes and other components to make the installation as simple and safe as possible for 3D printers. Now, a MOSFET is a great option to get around the deficiencies of control board switching electronics. However, you are still bound by the limitations of the PSU you're connecting it to. You have to account for the wattage of everything connected to that PSU, which includes all the steppers, your hot end and heater cartridges, and the rest of the printer fans and electronics. And that can be 100 watts or so on its own. You need to make sure the total wattage of all devices connected to the PSU is less than the rating of the PSU, and preferably less than 80% of that rating. Or you can step up to our next more complicated option, add a dedicated PSU. Now in this option, we'll add a second PSU dedicated to the heated bed and unencumbered by the draw of the other components. As long as your heated bed draws less than the PSU's rated wattage, again, preferably less than 80% of the rated wattage, you should be good to go. In fact, you could use a more powerful 24 volt PSU for a bed on a 12 volt printer, as most MOSFETs support both voltages and upwards of 20 to 25 amps. Now in this option, you leave the control board alone, but wire the MOSFET DCN to the dedicated PSU. The control board provides the control circuit as before, but the bed is now drawing from the dedicated PSU. Now, 24 volt PSUs commonly go up to 350 and sometimes even 500 watts, and that can drive a pretty beefy heater, but if you want real power, you're gonna need to step up to AC mains voltages. That's 110 volts here in the States and 220 in much of Europe. Now, most circuits in the US are rated for 15 amps, which will give you up to 1,650 watts, or even 2,200 watts if you have a more powerful 20 amp circuit. And that's a lot of heat very quickly. Now, for DC voltages, we used a MOSFET. For AC, we're going to use an SSR, or solid state relay. And wiring an SSR is a little more complicated than wiring a MOSFET. First, while a MOSFET had terminals for positive and negative DC voltage on both the input and bed sides, an SSR only has a single switch terminal pair. When the control circuit is closed, it bridges the two terminals. You should always put the SSR on the hot line to limit the exposure of a short circuit when the bed is not heating. The neutral line runs right past the SSR and directly to the bed heater. There is no immediate catastrophe if the neutral line shorts to ground. Now that brings us to two other important safety precautions when working with an AC heated bed. First, we still have a fuse in the load line with the bed. If this is an independent AC circuit, it needs a fuse. Second, when we run AC voltage only to this molded power switch and then it immediately terminates at the PSU, there's minimal risk of AC voltage shorting to the printer frame or to the heated bed. When we run AC up to moving parts, the risk of shorting to the frame or the bed goes up significantly. It's a very good idea to wire AC ground to the exposed metal of the printer frame. 
Now you want to ensure that you're connecting to bare metal, not any kind of coating or paint or whatever may be covering your extrusions. The X5SA has like this ideal little screw connection that connects directly to the interior of the aluminum rods. It's perfect for a ground connection. Now you should obviously make sure all of your AC connections are secure and insulated, of course. But grounding to the frame is just a little more assurance that you're not grabbing 110 volts when you grab the frame. And finally, unlike a MOSFET, the SSR trigger circuit is polarized. You have to be sure to connect the positive bed trigger voltage to the positive input terminal and the negative bed trigger voltage to the negative input terminal. If you get those backwards, the SSR may fail to close or even hold the circuit closed even when there's no voltage across the input. So now here we are. We got fuses on the load wire, check. Uh, the polarity of the control circuit is correct, check. Uh, our frame is grounded, check. We're, we're all good, right? Well, mostly. The thing with MOSFETs is that when they are overloaded or damaged, usually the FET itself blows up or the, the triggering circuitry is damaged in such a way that the circuit is left open and your bed is off. However, with an SSR, generally when they overload, they're stuck closed and the bed is left heating. Combine that with like a seedy undermarket of cheap misrated SSRs and you could be looking at a scenario in which your heated bed just keeps heating and heating and heating until it melts or, or, or worse. And since this is a hardware failure, thermal runaway protection actually offers no protection in this situation. So what to do? Uh, first, uh, you should buy an overbuilt SSR from a reputable company. Uh, I'm using a 40 amp SSR from Uxcel uh, where the draw of my bed is only about 6.5 amps. And second, you need to ensure that your SSR is appropriately heat synced. Now a 40 amp SSR with a six amp draw likely shouldn't require any passive or active cooling. However, I still secured it to the metal power supply frame to act as a heat sink. And finally, you should consider using a thermal fuse as even an overbuilt name brand SSR can still fail. A thermal fuse acts just like a normal fuse. However, instead of blowing when there's too much power is pumped through it, uh, a you know, thermal fuse will blow when the temperature gets too high. As with the regular fuse, you'll want the thermal fuse on the hotline. And the fuse will need to be positioned as close to the bed heater as possible. Now, some people use the screw-in type and, and tap a hole into the, the aluminum plate itself. However, barrel types are cheaper and easier to get here in the United States, and it, it fits well within like my bed sandwich. You just have to be sure to insulate the leads very, very well. And personally, I have a second safeguard against a runaway bed. My printer reports its temperatures to Home Assistant. It's, it's a free automation hub. If Home Assistant detects an overheat scenario, it will kill the smart switch that the printer is connected to. So now a lot of people print directly on their aluminum plate that came with the printer um, and you know maybe with like a thin surface stuck to it or something like that. Uh, and for those people just peeling off the sticky backing of the silicone heated bed and slapping it onto the bottom, uh, that might be fine. Uh, however, I print on glass. and I don't have as much trust in the 3M adhesive as others might have, especially when it's heating to 100 degrees and 110 volts are pumping through it. Uh, I prefer to have my mat supported on the bottom. Now, unfortunately, silicone heat mats are only flat on the top side. Uh, they have these power and thermistor leads wired to the middle of the bed, uh, creating this big obnoxious hump through the middle. So, I purchased cork tiles to use as an insulation and buffer layer. I cut a channel out of the cork for the wires as well as for the thermal fuse, and I made sure to cover the aluminum in high temp Kapton tape just in case something does rub through an insulation layer. Then you can just put the pad on the cork, the glass on the pad, everything is snug, clip that whole mess together, and you're done. Now that your bed's all wired up, it's a good idea to take a look at cable strain. Now, regardless of whether you have an i3 style printer with a constantly moving bed or a cube style printer where the bed just moves up and down, you still need to ensure that there's more than just solder holding the bed heater wires in place. Now, some printers account for this right out of the box, uh, but if not, you may need to come up with something customized to your printer. On the X5SA, there's this, this short static run to the bed cable chain, and a little Velcro does the trick. Uh, on the FT5, I had to print this little strain relief stand to keep strain off the solder joint. Okay, so now your bed is installed, uh, you're ready to go, you should be able to set a temp in your favorite tool and watch the temps rise, uh, but your control board probably has stored the PID settings from your old bed, so you might see some odd heating behavior, especially once the target temp is met and it's just trying to maintain. 
Uh, you'll want to PID tune since your new bed is likely very different from the old one you're replacing. Now, it's a simple set of commands in Marlin or Clipper. However, even weird third-party firmware should have some way of tuning heater PIDs. Running tuning and saving the settings will adjust how quickly power is switched to the heaters and reduce the bounce around the target temperature. So now you're installed, you're tuned, you should be ready to print on your new silicone heater. I hope you enjoyed this dive into silicone heated printer beds, and I hope it gave you some ideas to the benefits and complexity of stepping up to higher powered, faster heating beds. If you liked that video, hit that like button. If you liked my other videos, please consider subscribing, and I will see you in the next one.